long day, I got a lot to say. It feels like I'm carrying a two-ton weight. I go to see a friend. Hello, I'm Monsignor Patrick Winslow. And I am Father Matthew Cowth. And we are speaking from the rooftop. A podcast brought to you by Tan Books, in which we invite you to join our conversation out here in the open air where we look out upon the world around us from the rooftop of the church and share with you what we see. Makes me wanna scream from the rooftop to the street till I know I Hello. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. <laughs> it makes me laugh every time. You're just like, well... Well, hello. Yeah, well, hello. <laughs> hello. So we're on the rooftop of the church looking out in the world. We are. Please tell me what you see. What do I see? I see, I see right now um, the feast of St. Patrick and the way in which everyone. And on the horizon, St. Joseph. Joseph. So I thought we might want to talk a little bit about, from our vantage point, how one a celebrates saints days hmm. and how the church once regulated and to some degree still does her seasons by virtue of various um, saint days because one of the mm-hmm. things it's, it's really difficult to fathom is that planting crops harvesting various things throughout the year were all done on certain saints days because that's when it always happened Mm -hmm. but it became so ingrained in the people we have this idea a modern idea of course that that there was this thing called the church and there's this thing called the state and they were part of your wellness wheel uh, pieces in the Mm -hmm. pie as if the faith wasn't imbued in every possible sector of life Um, which was a bit confusing when they began to mess around with the calendar because you also messed around people's long Mm -hmm. traditions relative to these things. But two saints' days that have stayed the same and have stood the test of time for a while anyway. Means stayed the same on the calendar. On the calendar, and which have clear... uh, One has huge implications for everyone, that is today, which is a Friday in Lent. And the other one is rather new. The feast of St. Patrick, because by the time this airs, we'll be well past it. Exactly. But St. Patrick today, St. Joseph on the 19th, Whereas St. Joseph is a relatively new feast, not in itself per se, but in its its widespread celebration. So, mm-hmm. since you are named Patrick, maybe you want to begin with the nature of celebrating Saints' Days, but also celebrating St. Patty's Day. My earliest memory <laughs> of that's, celebrating... By the way, everyone out there, that's a long time no, ago. No, no, so no. go back to black and white. Oh, you Or just, perhaps even just, just radio. No. So my earliest memory of celebrating St. Patrick's Day really goes back to the time when McDonald's used to offer the shamrock shake. <laughs> and there was a special, or at least my family told me there was a special, that if you demonstrated proved in some way that your name was Patrick, they would give you one for free. Now, this is, is probably the reason your dad argument. named you Patrick. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Just for the benefit. He's so cheap. <laughs> That's true. Just for the benefit. Well, and so I remember telling my grandmother I wanted to go, right? It's a big deal. It's St. Patrick's Day. My name's Patrick. I get a free shamrock shake. But, you know, I, I, now that I look back at it, I suspect <laughs> my grandma just paid for the shake, Could but be. it was probably just a uh, something that was told to me. That said, it should have been free for Amen. all of us patrons out there. You know, I don't know what Saint Matthew's Day would bring about, but nothing. Maybe a small fry. Uh, no, it's tax day. It's tax day. <laughs> <laughs> you pay more. <laughs> Good point. Well, um, but you know, it's amazing how something as simple as that. I, you know, seared into my memory. Mm. So we often think about penitential time, but we don't always think about how we celebrate feasts. The notion of, of sacred time, I mean, it's even in the code of canon law, right? We talk about mm. um, sacred time and how we observe time and times of year. Uh, but that notion, we don't often look at. 
we were sort of caught in the current of a custom or a tradition. So St. Patrick's Day for me growing up, I remember corned beef and cabbage. It just, it was going to happen, right? Hmm. Hmm. It wasn't like we all looked forward to it the way you would look forward to a Thanksgiving turkey, but you just knew that you were going to have corned beef and cabbage because that's what you do. And when I was a kid, I also remember every Friday being no meat. Sure. So that's where I developed my total aversion to the flavor of fish. <laughs> because we because had, it probably wasn't fish. It was a fish stick. <laughs> and that is the really one of the nastiest flavors that I've ever, ever had to endure. And so as a kid, that was... I, I, I would take fasting all day long, and I'm a man who loves food. I would take fasting all day long to avoid that flavor. Now, I have entered into nicer fishes, and I don't. The way I get around it is I <laughs> I've say entered into nice. You sound like you sound, yeah, you sound like Jonah. I have entered into nicer fishes. nicer fishes. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I'm, I'm, I think of like salmon or sea bass. I'm like they're not really fish. That's how I get over my mental hurdle. It was that bad. Uh, but that said, I have a distinct memory of Fridays not having meat. I have a distinct memory of St. Patrick's Day having corned beef and cabbage. I have distinct memory about Christmas and Christmas Eve and Christmas Day dinners. And food then right. becomes right. very much a part of how we celebrate these feasts. Obviously... We should involve prayer. Obviously, we should involve actually reflecting upon the saint or the particular sacred occasion. But the way in which we manifest that joy and celebration, rightly named feasts, right. is by feasting. Right, right. No, so true. I think that the fish um, notion growing up every Friday, of course, that was the church's discipline. Um, and still is to some degree. You can substitute it, as you all know. But um, unfortunately, probably few as, few of us think to substitute it yeah. with anything significant. And so it, outside of it, Lent, and during the, Lent, it's required. Other, outside of Lent, right, you can substitute right. something else. And the problem the problem with that individual choice is understandable as it is, is just that it, it you lost something culturally. Yeah, because people did things together. You were, you didn't you didn't get a choice, and that was part right. of the goodness of it. Is that everyone was in the same boat, and so. We have that sense in Lent, but it's the reason that typically the McDonald's or whatever would have the fish fillet. There's no other reason to have that fish fillet except people didn't eat meat on Fridays. Um, mm -hmm. It's the reason you had all kinds of things that the Knights of Columbus would and still put on, right, related to fish fries and things like that. So it just, it just created a kind of cultural adhesion. And that's from a kid's perspective, really. That's what we're talking about. Because quite honestly, today, I was excited to hear the officer readings uh, the writing of St. Patrick. Right. Right. So now that I'm an adult, I have an appreciation for the life of the saint. Um, it's not just about corn, beef, and cabbage. No, but it does. I mean, if, if you can have both, right? Well, that's because, it. It is both. Yeah. The, the, the nature of, sometimes the nature of the faith gets approached um, almost too cerebrally and not so much viscerally. That we create these things in culture that everyone gets to be a part of. I mean, the Italian culture, of course, traditionally, you know, we're coming up on St. Joseph's and they have very specific food that only you only get on the Feast of St. Joseph. Mm -hmm. The Zeppoli? The Zeppoli. Yeah. Um, and like the raisin. And lots of different feasts that had the same sort of thing. And it typically was, not always, but typically tied to that's exactly the kind of time in which this thing was available. Mm -hmm. We're so used now to being able to basically get any kind of food any time of year. But yeah. the Italians still do have a sense of this is what you eat at this time of year, or that time of year. And it, it you know, became embroidered into the lives of these various feast days of the saints. And I, I love that because you, you, you realize you're not going to get that again. That's the one time, which we kind of do with turkey. Like how many people make a turkey the rest, yeah. the rest of the year? And you may want to throw that out say, I don't even like turkey. On some level, it doesn't matter. We all would try to do a better job of a turkey every year and try yeah. to come up with a new recipe. But it's just the fun of doing it. And knowing that everyone, all these people that you don't know, are going to the grocery store for the same reason same as reason. you, doing the same sort of thing. Yeah. It does breed a type of community yeah, among uh, people of a, of some 
common purpose. Yeah. And so uh, it has deeper significance in the life of the faithful as manifesting a type of communion that is deeper, but these are fruits of that. Right, you right. Know, um, it, it, it makes a lot of sense that the actual feasting yeah. is part of celebrating a feast day. But as a kid, I never woke up and said, hey, I can't wait to learn or think about St. Patrick today. I mean, right. you know, it, was, it, was a, it was a shamrock and it was the shake. It was you know, one of those little leprechauns, you know, it was a lot of green. <laughs> a lot and of then green. You go through your teenage years and college years, it's all about green beer and things like that. Yeah, and that's a that's an interesting question, isn't it? You wonder to some degree, to the extent to which we have dropped these things. Yeah. In some ways it is the extent Fulton Sheen used to say, you know, we dropped the beads, meaning the rosary, and people started hanging them up. Mm-hmm. Um we dropped we go through a list of things saying that these were cultural artifacts that were driven by a cohesion to a faith that we dismissed or dropped or lost the meaning of. And since the world has no real things to sort of bring it together, the secular realm, they've picked them up. But then yeah. they infuse them with, with secular, their value. secular values. Which so the, the green beer, the... the partying, the, 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 the carnevale, which literally means say goodbye to me, right? Because yeah. our fast used to be more serious. And so a carnival, a carnevale or, or um, Mardi Gras, which is literally right, Fat Tuesday. Yeah. They get co-opted. They get co-opted. They, they and, they, and, and the Christians used to be the one co-opting the secular culture. Yes. Uh, but you're right. It, it is a flip. And, you know, our, our and they've taken them and they love it. I mean, the whole world loves St. Patty's Day. Well, they like Mardi Gras. They like we don't Saint think Day about St. Like Patty's Day, right? St. Patrick. Just like all the names yeah. that you have in, in Spanish uh, colonial culture, right? Mm-hmm. From Sacramento to Los Angeles, right? To, to San Diego, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. No one thinks about those places as having anything to do with, with the faith. But of course they did. They did. And we've lost it. Absolutely. Now, Absolutely. that being said, not to be dour, I guess the question then it's becomes... too late for that. <laughs> how do you how do we regenerate I mean, because i don't i don't think it yes you can do it in terms of your family and you should you should have those saints that you're particularly devoted to the saints to whom your kids are devoted to especially if you if your if your children have a any particular devotion to a saint but also the the their name day which is still a part of most of western catholic culture celebrating one's name day one's saint's name also their their confirmation saints etc those should be particularly highlighted in 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 the in the course of a family's year um and it could be special things you only get at that time that's a great way to do it i do think though there's it's still sort of lacking that it doesn't make other people do it um or invite other people to do it and so that's one thing ecclesial or even in terms of a parish you could sort of institute that these are certain feasts in a parish, which, you know, you did at, at St. Thomas, for example, the World Feast, because we had so many nationalities there, mm-hmm. but which is not celebrating a particular saint, but just another... It was the conclusion of our Fatima devotions. It was, the Fatima devotions. So it was devotion. the first Saturday after May, um, October 13th, the miracle. Because Our Lady's Fatima is for everyone. And it's universal. Yeah, it's yeah. a universal devotion. And before that, at the other parish, you had the wonderful Italian Fest. Which Italian was, Festival, which no one was, was Italian. That, was that St. Gennaro's? Or was it, I uh, don't even know what... What day we did it on? Yeah, okay, I, I can't remember. It actually <laughs> corresponded to a a sweet spot in the local calendar. Gotcha. Uh, but that said, it was a it was a wonderful occasion. Whereas these things are a lot of work. They're a lot of work, which means they will go to the wayside if you don't show up and yes. pull them off. Yes, and you know, I'm disappointed a bit that things got scaled back. On and, you know, yeah. and some of my efforts to bring something to it but i grew to bring these types of festivals these feasts uh to parish life they get turned into picnics and things like that which is just a bit small ball it's not yeah. quite the same yeah so i grew up with feasts you know there was the feast of our lady of fatima there was the feast of saint anthony's and people would go to them they would go out for days they would start like a on a thursday we go thursday maybe a friday but definitely a friday saturday sunday but they could start earlier. Mm-hmm. And there would definitely be food that you wouldn't get anywhere else. Yeah. And up in upstate New York, you'd also have some gambling, a gambling tent, you know, things like that. Um, that was just, yeah, that was part of the culture. So you had all sorts of things that were going on. They bring in a carnival, you know, mm. with the rides. Yes, right, right, right. Everybody looked forward to it. The town, Catholics and non-Catholics, 
would be sorely disappointed without it. Right. The easy thing to do is not do it. Right. The easy thing to do Let these is to die. say, well, consider all the work we put into it. It's not a really a money raiser, you know, a fundraiser, because if you consider the hours of labor, or we're all working for less than minimum wage in order to generate this income. But that's not what you do it. Right. Right. Exactly. We I, did. I, I, I can't even imagine a life where those feasts and festivals didn't happen. But yet people in many dioceses are growing up where these things are like relics of the past. Yes. And this is a, this is a huge, hugely problematic in the fact that we have you now we have the vast majority of people um, who are would consider themselves fairly lonely um, because there, there aren't those sort of social um, invitations to be part of something. And you know, I was reading a book recently, a really interesting book, um, just about the sort of disconnectedness of, of the youth relative to um, they've only grown up with social interactions on their phone. And so they, they don't have meaningful conversations with people often time. And they're, they're quite content on some level with not doing that, which is massively problematic mm. for, the, for the future. Yeah. But it's not that hard to create, but it does take work. I remember at a parish I had in the mountains when I was up there, um, someone came up to me and just talked about a festival he had when he was a kid, which was for Corpus Christi. And instead of doing the the flower petal um, images upon which you would walk with the monstrance, right, as, as part of the procession for Corpus Christi, um, his parish did sawdust. And they would color sawdust, tons and tons of sawdust. And they would color it, all kinds of different you know, sh- uh, shades, they would design things and lay them out on these quote unquote chalk carpets, and you'd take the different colors and you would you would fill them in almost like a, like a crayon sort of book, right? And I I said let's do it, let's try it, and he organized it. He was great at it, um, and it became a, a parish custom, you know, for five, six, seven years, and to the point where I had kids, you know, that started it when they were three or four, and then you know they get to seven, eight, or nine, they just assume. Right, that's this is what everyone does. Oh, for them, it's at that always time been of year, that way. and you infuse it with all kinds of, you know, I mean, as soon as you've walked through with the blessed sacrament, then you walk back back out with cotton candy, pretzels, you know, you name it. You gotta, yeah. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta give some incentive. Absolutely. Um, but unfortunately, that was stopped too. But in his parish, he said it had gone on for like a hundred years mm-hmm. um, that they had done this thing, and you and, would never imagine not doing it. Yeah. Right, it just would be something you wouldn't do. It's the same sort of thing, um, you know. For Christmas time, I think at Christmas time, it's hard to imagine our society, our culture, not having the decorations and the lights and things like yeah. that. That said, it all needs to be rooted in something deeper and more meaningful. Right, right. It right. all needs to be connected. If it is, it's just a powerful synergy across the board. Uh, it's the way life should be led, with a sense of sacred time. A sense of a rhythm of a week, of a year, a sense of a rhythm of the seasons of the church and the feasts of the church. Uh, it's it it's a natural sense, right? These rhythms are natural, and we build upon them, and we co-op nature to mm-hmm. reflect uh, a higher meaning, a higher significance, yeah. uh, an eternal rhythm, if you will, and eternal realities. I remember reading about Ratzinger when he was a boy. He commented what it was like growing up in a community in, was it Marktel Inn? I think that's where he was okay. raised in Marktel Inn, uh, Southern Bavaria, Germany. He commented about how Catholicism was the great equalizer. The faith was the great equalizer. He said, you would show up on Saturday and in the same confession line would be a humble manual worker and the most wealthy person in town, mm-hmm. all standing there as sinners waiting to go and confess and to humble themselves before God. And all knelt the same rail. They knelt the same rail. Uh, they confessed to the same God. That it was equalizing, that there was something so profoundly um, impactful about that notion. Right, that we all have various roles of stewardship under God and levels of authority that are just participations and the only one who has authority who is him. But in the end... And, but you're all, in the end, attempting to at work his, for the common good and you're at his mercy. You're at his mercy. At his service. Yeah. And it, and then I would imagine that would inspire, it should have inspired, 
a sense of respect and dignity from somebody who had a higher social status or economic situation toward those who were in lesser yes. rungs and n- not breed as much animus as one may have if in you know in the, in the reversal where somebody might be lesser economic condition or less or lesser social level because they see each other in, as, as dealing with the same fabric of life, the same eternal realities. Well, and we can speak to this as priests too. I mean, it's, it's interesting that, that we're professionally at, at times we, we spoke about this many times, we're sort of professionally devotional. In other words, mm-hmm. it, we're sacramentally configured to be able to give God's gifts to his people. And as a result, it's part of your opus day. It's part of your labor, your work of God to do that. And, and as a matter of fact, there's a great line from a book I once read called uh, Judas Marriage. And this woman in the book is converting and her first experience of Catholicism and beginning this process, she goes to a, a mass and she sees this priest walk up there and sort of lay out his chalice and mess with a book and sort of he's dressed up in his clothes she doesn't understand. And, and she described it as, it seemed as if he was a plumber who walked up there with his tool toolbox, you know, laid him out on the altar, um, unleashed, you know, got the waters working, opened the taps, closed the taps back off, and then put everything back into his, his toolbox and then and then went home. And that's true professionally. Like you and I are conduits of that for the people of God. And as devotional as that can be for us personally, it need not be because we can we can do the work without it be participating in the work. And the reason I bring that up is that one of the things I, I think is so interesting is, as priests that you and I can you know, have engaged in before, whether it's the Fatima processions at the parish or actual pilgrimages. The thing that's always struck me about pilgrimages, especially when I was living in Rome and I saw so many priests come, is to watch the priests with the faithful doing something devotional. Yeah. Where they're not sort of leading by virtue of a sacrament and as as it were unleashing like a plumber those right. those waters of of grace. Um but they're they're walking up on their knees. They're touching their rosary to a saint's tomb. Right? They're kneeling down praying the rosary itself or or devotionally beholding the body of a saint or etc. Um I love watching and having the opportunity myself to do things with the faithful that we're all kind of at that same communion rail. To see the shepherd as a pilgrim. Yeah. You know, that's very important. I, I also like devotions and acts of piety because they're coming from ourselves. They're coming from within and they're gestures toward God by our own initiation. Whereas when you go to Mass, you're fundamentally on the receiving end. Right. right. You are receiving... Christ's offering and sacrifice, his body and blood. You're receiving him. And, uh, you know, to be quite honest, he's the one doing the work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, we go there and we are served. Right. Same thing with any of the other sacraments. But when, when you have a devotion, like, for example, the Fatima devotion, where we had these processions on the 13th of the month from May 13th to October 13th, the time of the apparitions of Our Lady of Fatima in Portugal, when we did those, you went and you gave. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about receiving. Mm -hmm. It was about you giving. And I have to say, if anyone had requested that we had a mass as part of that devotion, I would have said no. Right. Because it would have changed that. Right. And again, I'm a big fan of, oh, of daily course, mass. Of course, and, absolutely. And um, uh, you know, that's the thing that hooked me in my right. life is daily mass. But you also need opportunity to give. Right. And to be creative in that giving. I mean, you know, there's no question about, you know, a, a, a conscious and active role relative to the Holy Mass. That is to say, I'm uniting right. my sacrifices. I'm uniting my will. You put something I'm, into I'm it. Participating. Yeah. I'm participating. I'm, I'm putting something in. I'm kneading my sufferings, as it were, into the into that bread before it's consecrated. I'm, I'm trying to offer. But it is ultimately his sacrifice at, w- at which we come to adore and to receive. And as you say, with the devotions, there's something that's sort of uniquely creative about them. 
in our response to what we did at Holy Mass. Like, I'm going to bake this thing. I'm going to make this uh, carpet. I'm going to um, have you mean this by carpet? You mean the, the, the chalk. The chalk carpets carpets and the flower that you carpets would walk on and destroy Corpus them Christi, with right? your, your feet. With your feet, which seems so incredibly... Right, it's a sacrifice. It's, it's an yeah, offering. it's wonderful. Um, and, and this simple but beautiful way in which communities across Christendom have always responded to God's gifts. They have come up with things to say, now it's our turn. Yeah. Now we want to give you this. This is why it takes work and why it's not about the bottom line or the finance or whatever else. So I don't mean to throw any of our, our brother priests, you know, under the bus and so, so as to say, go out to your priest and tell him, let's do these devotions or whatever <laughs> else. Um, it shouldn't be something the priest organizes, frankly. Mm-hmm. Right? It should be something that the faithful organize, mm-hmm. that the priest can support. Um, that you come to, with these various saints' days or whatever is important to the parish, to the people of your parish, etc., and say, let's start something. And it can be small, but let it be consistent. And get people on board with you offering something back to, to our Lord in honor and praise of the saint and his work in that saint or this particular feast day or whatever the case may be. Such that the parish is a place where we don't just come to Holy Mass, but it's the place where we're going to go give something to our Lord with consistency. Yes. And the way in which you could get something started, the right way to get something started, would be not to go to your priest and say, hey, we should be doing this. Exactly. Because <laughs> what the priest hears is... You should be doing this. You should be doing this, right? right? The priest hears somebody telling them what, another thing they need to do. But if you go to the your, your parish priest and you say, look, um, I think this would be a really good idea. What do you think? I'd be willing to organize it, make it happen. But it can't be so priest dependent that it becomes almost like another event on the schedule. It really ought to be the devotion of the faithful. Now, it doesn't mean that there isn't a place of course, uh, for the priest to lead, to lead to something or to be a part of it. But if needed, a deacon could step in or if needed... and you know, even a seminarian for a, on a summer assignment could be able to pull something off, that sort of thing. If you approach it that way, if that is your request, you might get somewhere. Yeah. I mean, it's what really priest doesn't love, doesn't love to walk into his church, his parish center, his whatever, yeah. where he's stationed and see people praying, see mm-hmm. people doing these acts of devotion to our Lord. I just did a parish mission uh, at a local parish here. And it was it was striking. The parish is open all day long, and doesn't close until nine p.m. And you know, I went there throughout various parts of the day, and I don't think I ever went in there and didn't see people yeah. um, praying. I think um, that's the way it should be. Absolutely. Yeah, I think uh, doors to churches should be open. I think we have te- enough technology these days to monitor and to keep secure yes. cameras, alarms, things like that. I mean. I, even some parishes that have perpetual adoration, right. the people who go, they know the code, and it's just a little punch code mm. to be able to get in. I think we can use technology enough. I don't like the excuse for security and safety purposes. We throw a bolt. And, well, it's you know, funny right you say that mass. because I just finished <laughs> a trip outside this diocese, and I tried to three different churches. There were a lot, so I called some more. Mm-hmm. And every, per- every single church said, I just want to go pray. Yeah. And yes, I can pray in my room. And I did. But I, you know, I was on the road and I really wanted to be able to pray before the Blessed Sacrament. Mm -hmm. And the churches that I called said the same thing. For security purposes, we have to, we we don't open up until 10 minutes before Mass and we like lock up right after it. Yeah. Now, mind you, this one place I was traveling was probably the highest income per capita place I've ever been in my life. Right, right. There was not exactly a lot of risk of (laughs) danger. See, if I were a, a wealthy benefactor, I think I would make a restrict a restricted donation toward a church project that the doors of the church would have to be open. That I'd be happy to, that a portion of whatever funds that I gave would go to the security system to allow for that to be done safely. But honestly, why, you know, why raise all of this money among the faithful to build a church that has that have these slim, narrow windows? I know. No, right. it, these are places. This to is go for them. Anytime. This is for the faithful. Open the doors. Yes, open the doors. Amen. Let us in. Amen. What is wrong Preach with it, those brother. Priests? Preach it. What is wrong with those priests? <laughs> 
you know, the, 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 some disgruntled parishioners are going to be sending this to, to oh, yeah. our various brother priests and saying, these priests say you they should say. <laughs> I know. Well, listen, I'll throw you under the bus. I say, well, that, Father Kauth was mimicking me, and I didn't really say that. That's right. Exactly. He, he, <laughs> um, oh, some sort no, of deniable. We, we know that there's always difficulties, but it can happen, and it must happen to keep these churches open. No, it's true. And uh, honestly, I have no problem making that argument to our brother priests. It's so important. It is, it, it, and it's it, it's almost to the level of a pet peeve. Mm. You know, I I'm principally opposed to the notion, but I'm so irritated by it. It's almost as though pet peeves are escalating something from principle to mm. something even higher. I'm, it's, it peeves me. Well, good. You're in, you're in a position to do something about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hate that kind of work. <laughs> well, before we go, Father. Yes. Um, what you were just talking about reminded me of a beautiful little story uh, that I recall when I lived in Rome. For the most part, there are some Roman churches, 500 churches in the vicinity of Rome. I mean, a lot of churches. And obviously, a lot of them are locked. And some of them are locked at odd hours of the day, and they're all locked at night. A couple churches have some night adoration, etc. But there was one church down from where I lived, and he would stay open until like 11 o'clock or midnight. The church? The church itself would. So the priest would keep the church open? He kept it open. And it was right on a very busy shopping thoroughfares a little close to the Trevi Fountain. So imagine how many people come by there. Sure. So he's attempting to provide an oasis that's people close to the people maybe will stop in to be quiet. To pray. And to pray. Devotion. What was really interesting about that church is 24-7, 365 days a year, he had Christmas music playing. <laughs> <laughs> was it recognizable? It was. It was. And It's not like old-fashioned Christmas music where... It sounds no, like chant. chant. No, no, no. It was. You just I mean, there was the some word. of that too, but it was mostly things you would recognize. Um, so there were like Christmas carols, uh, quite a few, and some in English, wow, in Italy. Right? I don't know where. How do you, I don't know how he put his uh, his in musical selection. selection together. He probably he probably put his first and only selection together during the Christmas season, and just has it on a loop. It. So I I did find a way to ask someone in that church one time, and this is kind of an interesting response. Because the music was kind of piped out from the church. Like uh, once you got in, you didn't really hear it. So it was almost a, a hook. It was a hook. To pull people in. And the idea was that everyone loves Christmas music. Isn't that right? I thought that was so clever. Yeah. I mean, it was, it, once I you really lived there, you kind of got zeal. sick of it. <laughs> but I, mean, I loved fantastic. the zeal. I loved the idea. He just wanted people to go into his church and pray. And people did. People so, did. All right. Well, then on my last thing, I'll kind of pick up on that thought. In essence, what this priest is doing he isn't preaching to these people but he's letting the church Mm. itself Mm. preach to them Mm -hmm. all of the sacred elements uh all of the sacred images the atmosphere the feel the way prayer sticks to the walls and to the seats right as a kid i can bear witness to how powerful a church can have an impact as a child when I went to church, in fact, I could say pretty much up until I was about 20, I don't think I ever remembered a single word a priest ever said at any homily. They could have been the most beautiful orations, the most important and poignant things spoken. Hmm. But as a kid, That's right. I remember the church. That's right. Because my eyes were all over it. That's right. And when we would go to some of the really more beautiful, <laughs> ornate churches, yes, it leaves an impression on you. Oh, I remember the very first time it I speaks. went back home with you. Mm-hmm. We were in seminary, um, and you just took me from one church to another. And conversely, I grew up in a pizza hut. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it had an impression. Yeah, it speaks. Yeah, it had a huge impression. The old adage is that we form our buildings and then the, the buildings form us. Yeah. And that's true. Especially the imagination for a child. Oh yeah, it's, that's mm. the truth. And so, very, uh, very clever idea this this man to allow the church to be able to evangelize and using the Christmas music and an open door as a hook and a net. Yep, it's fantastic. It was good for him. Yeah, I don't think he's listening, but in case he is, well bravo, done. bravo, bravo. <laughs> I'll stop in now. I'm going to go look for it. In fact, you probably just. 
boosted among the tens of people that listen to us, boosted um, <laughs> the traffic uh, to his tra- church. Traffic to his church is part of a destination well, for pilgrims. You know, drop a euro in there and help him with the upkeep. Yeah. So, you have to go there. do you remember the name of the church? I. I All right. I, next I, next time we I need do to circle back. Do you remember it now? I think I do. Yeah. Do but I'll I'll, I'll, I'll I'll we'll confirm. Check it. it. We'll check it on the map. Make sure we get it right. Um, watch the the pastor has probably been moved on and it's somebody else who locks sure. the door but hopefully it's still happening yeah amen have a blessed week everyone All and right. a blessed feast of St. Patrick even though it'll be gone and over by the time you get and here and St. Joseph by the gets you, and St. Joseph and, and the Annunciation the Annunciation and that don't we wear do we wear a rose this weekend yeah we're, at, we're halfway there we're more than halfway through a season that anticipates a feast yeah and that's then, a lot going on and then Holy Week. Holy Week. We have Passion Week. So we have we have that four time before Palm Sunday, and then we have Palm Sunday and Spy Wednesday, Holy Thursday. But we'll be back before then. That's your feast day. To give Spy Wednesday. Yes. Yeah, that's the that's the betrayer's uh mm-hmm. day. When yep. Saint jo- when uh when Judas our is blessed Lord around. was betrayed by Judas, yeah. Yep. There we will see Father Kauth. <laughs> Having to, well, I to can't suppress deny his it. inner demons. I can't deny it. And St. Philip Neri used to say every morning, the first thing he said to our blessed Lord, one of the first things he said every single day, watch out, Lord. Today, Philip's going to betray you. Oh, if you begin with that notion that humble. I need his grace to be able to not betray him. Yeah. It's true. So that's really... I think I, I've turned this around on its head. And precious prayer there. It is a precious prayer. Yeah. Anyway. Maybe you should say that. Don't worry. I will. <laughs> <laughs> God bless you all. All right. Ciao. Makes me wanna scream from the rooftop to the screen. Thanks for listening to this episode of From the Rooftop. For updates about new episodes, special guests, and exclusive deals for From the Rooftop listeners, sign up at rooftop podcast.com and remember for more great ways to deepen your faith check out all the spiritual resources available at tanbooks.com and we'll see you again next time from the rooftop Anywhere.